Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So I <clears throat> was thinking of giving a, a second talk on the final six of the eight verses for training of the mind, which we began last week. But then I realized that it's Valentine's Day week, the least favorite holiday for celibate monastics across the world. So I thought that would be way more fun to talk about or at least a good uh, appropriate time to speak on it. I think it's worth talking about because There was a teacher who I've spoken of before. His name was Bhante Nyanananda from Sri Lanka, who was asked how he would summarize the whole of the Buddhist teaching in one word. And he said if he had to pick a word in Pali that captured the essence of this path the most, it would be the word Yavadeva. And that word in Pali means only for the sake of. I think it's a beautiful recollection in that the term not only encourages and speaks to an ethic of contentment and knowing when is enough but also of the goal for which it is enough, only for the sake of. So the term begs the question, uh, only for the sake of what? And of course, in the Buddhist context uh, and on this path, the what is Nibbana or awakening and the complete purification of the heart. When the Ajahn Sona also speaks about the chant which we began this whole session with, the Mangala Sutta, which is the chant on the highest blessings. And the first verse of that sutta speaks about how one of the great blessings in life is uh, avoiding those of foolish ways, associating with the wise, and honoring those worthy of honor. These are the highest blessings. Um, he goes on to reflect how much of our lives, the story of our lives, is so often those first two lines much of what we talk about with others, how we articulate the narrative of our path through these decades and years, is the great people we've spent time with and the difficult people we've spent time with and what they've given us or what we perceive them as having taken from us. But the third line, honoring those worthy of honor, is significant in that it denotes a pivot point, the quintessential difference in a life that is devoted towards something higher and a life that is simply subconsciously moving along the contours of pleasure and pain 
and worldly gain and the goals held to us by society. So the question that third line asks is, do we have something in life which we honor, which we devote ourselves, and which we use as a point of orientation for life? Do we have something that we honor? And almost every culture throughout history has been able to answer yes to that. There's always been some framework where some ideal of spiritual awakening in some form or image or articulation is held up. And yet our culture, especially in the West, is moving through a unique time where many of those systems and frameworks for life that hold up one goal as transcendent and able to orient all things around it is absent. Ajahn Sumedho talks about how during his first years at Amravati, he began to have become extremely interested and almost obsessed with this image of a stupa, of a, of a pyramid namely the fact that there's this fifth point, the highest point, that unifies and draws together the four corners. And that without that fifth unifying single point of orientation, the transcendent, the final goal, that which is worthy of honor, then everything else is stuck in dualities and this realm of four directions. There's no unifying element. And something in our hearts knows this. And so what's very interesting is to watch how a culture deprived of a clear articulation of such a transcendent goal struggles and flails looking for something to place its heart on and to imbue with that same gravity, which we sense we need. And our culture has tried to do this with several things. It's done its best to raise up our artists as spiritual guides. And however, noble many artistic pursuits are, and however good many artists are as people. Bukowski is not a great guide for how you want to live your life. Similarly, romantic love has gained a place in our culture as an end goal. And this isn't always made conscious, but the sheer proliferation of Hugh Grant movies. Uh, Notting Hill was always my favorite as a layman. <laughs> um, and romantic comedies or romance. Um, if you just listen to the lyrics of the songs on the radio, you see how this delusion that romantic love can and should fulfill one creeps into our hearts. And what a terrible thing to place on another person, to expect them to fulfill you. Because statistically, it's very unlikely that you've ended up with a person that was perfect for you. It's almost, almost surely you have not. And if that is the final goal, to find the the one, then that's a problem. And it's very far and few between, I think, that people find relationships which really fulfill all these parts of themselves that they are looking for. And to place so much weight on relationship, I think, is one of the reasons that there's very few relationships that don't crack under that stress a little bit, at least.
But if, you know, I'm always reminded of a scene from Fiddler on the Roof where um, the main character, what's his name? Tivia? Tavia? Tavia. Tavia. Okay. <laughs> Tavia is uh, asking his wife if she loves him. And they, they come to the conclusion that, yeah, they, they love each other. But it's a love couched in mutual support and care rather than passion. And not that there's not a place for passion in relationship, um, but I find it indicative of how humanity has related to relationship and relational romantic love for most of its history in that it is one beautiful element of a life, but it is only one element of a life. And what a relief to know that a relationship can be good, that you can support one another, but that you can take some of the weight off of it. And I think the only way to really take some of that weight is to place because the heart has a need to place itself and look to something as its orientation. And yet, only when it finds that orientation in the spiritual, in a greater love, does every other relationship and goal in our life fall into its proper place. I'm reminded of um, you know, in college, I uh, went through the usual, you know, I don't know if anyone else looking back at their relationships in high school and college, it feels like it was a bit of a bloodbath, but it certainly felt that way for me looking back. A lot of very sad emo songs for like four or five months at a time. And, uh, but just seeing that a huge portion of that was searching for something to give my heart to. And as soon as I stumbled across the Dhamma in a pure sense, then so much of that was relieved because I saw how it was the first thing that was truly worthy of that love and that I'd been searching for. There's a layman who's part of this community. Um, I've spoken of him recently, but uh, he's the same layman I spoke of last week who his dog recently fractured his spine and was uh, unable to move for, I think, six weeks. And if he did move, he would fracture it again. So this man sat with his dog in his arms for 12 hours a day for six weeks, holding it and keeping it safe. And... Um, Similarly, uh, this man and other practitioners I know have had to navigate relationship. And so many of them have come to this place where they're with someone who they care for and who they can find a, a way to be in a mutually supportive spiritual partnership with, where there is great love. But it doesn't always conform to the traditional cookie cutter image of how a romantic relationship should be. But it's one of mutual support and care, so it's enough. And I find the image of the caring for that dog as especially meaningful because it speaks to how when there's a transcendent purpose of purification of the heart, then all these other loves become means towards a greater love and ways of touching and cultivating something much larger. So, you know, you think of if just caring for a pet for six weeks, if that's all it is, then maybe your time's better spent, you know, you know who knows how many chickens you could purchase from a farm and take off to a chicken refuge or raise his pets and save and you know fair enough but if something's seen as a means towards a greater a greater love and cultivating that then 
holding a dog for six weeks to keep it from hurting itself is much more than just a service to one small being. It's something much greater, and it's a way of cultivating something in the heart which is truly profound. And I think that those six weeks are one of the more impressive examples I've seen of how even in this seemingly mundane suburban existence, uh, I've heard it referred to as mundania, there's opportunity to touch and cultivate the transcendent everywhere that we're constantly missing if we don't look carefully. And just as that act is a way of reaching and touching something much greater, similarly, romantic relationship, I really think, if held correctly, can also be a way of reaching through something and someone to touch a much greater love. And there are many ways of doing this, but I think practical ways of just So often the difference between a rote and habitual act of making the bed uh, that one sleeps in with their loved one or folding laundry, just adding a little bit extra is what transforms it from a rote act into a gift. So, you know, can there be a little poem left for the person or, you know, some, you know, how much, how difficult is it to bring the person you care for, um, you know, a cup of something when they aren't expecting it. Um, just these little bits of extra effort can make all the difference between a relationship fading into a routine and being actively cultivated and used as a tool on the Buddhist path. But of course what this means is finding a way to cultivate a relationship with the practice that is similarly devoted and almost romantic in a sense. So Longpur Sumedho was once talking about how, his, how he keeps the sound of silence, the nada sound, which is a meditation object that's a subtle hissing or ringing right below the auditory landscape, how he relates to it. And he spoke about how the moment he wakes up, it's there waiting for him. And as he's eating, it's there. It's the last thing he hears when he goes to sleep. And someone commented that it sounded like he was speaking about a lover. And he said, yes, it's, it's similar. So can we have this constant presence and orientation towards our meditation object, towards our practice? In the Christian tradition, they make a really interesting distinction between an object of meditation and an object, sorry, between attention and intention. And I think this is a powerful distinction because when mindfulness is framed as cultivating attention on an object throughout the day, then it necessarily implies splitting your awareness between the object of your current task, like a conversation, uh, some work thing you have to do, and the object of your meditation practice, such as the breath. So there can always be this tension of trying to keep both in your mind. And it's useful in terms of training, but it also can be fragile, and you can tie yourself into knots very easily. Uh, Longpur Sumedho talks about how he was so focused on trying to be mindful during his first years as a monk that he just kept tripping over stuff because he was so focused on being mindful, whereas he just wasn't, as opposed to just being mindful as he walked. However, intention is 
the orientation of the heart. And what's so interesting about the meditation practices of loving kindness, of love, is that at first it is an object. We bring to mind a image of someone we love, a word that brings up this warmth. But as that object initiates and catalyzes that warm sense of care, then loving kindness becomes less an object of attention and more a quality of intention. It's as if we've been shining a flashlight on an object and suddenly we move our eyes from the object upon which we're shining the light to the light itself. And what's so useful about that is that if loving kindness imbues our awareness and our hearts and our activities, there's no need to split awareness in the same way. You simply approach a situation with the intention of love. And so this is why Brahma, the Brahma Viharas or loving kindness practices are such robust and stable bases of meditation practice during daily life. The Brahma Viharas can withstand an enormous amount of activity and chaos and tumultuousness and interaction in a way that a single pointed focus on an object of attention, such as the breath, sometimes cannot. And that's because once that beam of the flashlight has become imbued with metta and warmth, you just shine it on a conversation. And you find that you're approaching this conversation with this sense of care, with warmth, with well-wishing. And there's no need to split your attention between the breath and the person you're talking to. It's just an imbuing of the object of your uh, activity with that quality of intention. And there really is a place, obviously, for cultivating the more refined anchor of the breath, of keeping, you know, 25% of your awareness with your body, even in conversation, when and if you're able. But much of the time, we don't have that ability. And being able to hold loving kindness as a field of intention upon which our lives play out can be a very helpful paradigm and refuge, and it's stable. So just as we cultivate the practice as a love, as a partnership, all the things that one would do or many of the things which one would do for a partner to keep a relationship vital and alive, one also needs to cultivate towards the meditation practice and the practice in general. At a recent retreat, someone asked the question of, uh, spoke about her practice and said that, look, you know, my practice is good. I've been doing it for years. Um, the mind wanders, but I still come out of meditation feeling pretty, pretty all right. But I sense that I'm getting habituated to it. And I'm not investigating or exploring or pouring myself into my meditation like I used to. And how do I remedy that? And the two reflections that I had from my own experience, because we all fall into that, and I certainly have and do, is first of all, to uh, take a vacation with your loved one, um, metaphorically, and the opportunity to go on retreat and really investigate and dive into practice in a deeper way is essential to keep in the rhythm, in the yearly rhythm of a practitioner. The Buddha designated three months of every year where the monks have to stay in at one spot and devote themselves, generally is what they do, to practice. 
It's as if during our regular life, we are trying to carefully manipulate the conditions and methodology of our practice, like a scientist carefully mixing chemicals on a table, but someone just keeps coming along and kind of kicking the table every few hours. So it's very helpful to have a period of a few days, uh, a week, a month, where one can just um, hold a space of stillness in which to really dive into practice. And that this can rekindle that passion towards practice, because we do lose it over time. The Pali word is chanda, or zeal. And it exists in a bit of a feedback loop. So once you get it going, it lasts for a long time, but it can fade too. And in the service of that, there are a lot of resources one can use. There's monasteries in California, such as Abayagiri, in British Columbia, such as Birkin, um, in Western or Eastern Washington, such as Shervasti. There's Thich Nhat Hanh's communities. And many of these are completely free. Um, certainly all the ones in our tradition are. And you can just go there for a day or two days or three days and stay. And if you want to stay for a week, then you can do that. Or two weeks, then that's okay too. The other thing that I found has helped rekindle passion towards the practice is to spice things up a bit. And when one has found themselves falling into a rote approach towards meditation, uh, a breath or otherwise, taking a book of a teacher, perhaps still in your tradition, because it's useful to have a broad framework, but who approaches the whole thing from a slightly different approach or angle, can really make things interesting again. So, for example, if one has been leaning on Ajahn Tanisro, Ajahn Jeff's breath techniques, which are amazing and people can find on dhammatalks.org, we also have a bunch of his books in the back, then one can, if things have become dry, read Shayla Catherine's uh, Wisdom Wide and Deep, for example. She's an amazing practitioner, and her meditation instructions are slightly different. They're more originating out of the Burmese, but it's similar, and her slightly different articulations can sometimes reinvigorate a practice in a way that's Maybe it's a little like couples counseling. I'm not sure what the analogy here is, but it's very helpful. Similarly, um, one can, uh, you know, Shayla Catherine Wisdom Wide and Deep. If you haven't read Ajahn Brahm's approach to breath meditation um, and jhana, that's a very powerful resource. He approaches from a slightly different angle. Um, and then there's, uh, Aya Ananda Bodhi has some beautiful breath instructions as well. So just taking a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a honeymoon or something like that and exploring the different modes of practice can be very helpful. Have we lost our Q&A, Allison? It's okay. <laughs> it happens. No worries. For me, a lot of this comes together in, um, you know, and then giving gifts to our practice. In Thailand, it's very common to bring flowers to a shrine every uh, morning and evening. And the word puja, which is in the chant we did, puja pujaniyanang, honoring those worthy of honor. Uh, a puja is this offering. and. It can be as simple as uh, what we traditionally offer is flowers, which means morality. Because uh, the Buddha said this, the fragrance of clean morality uh, pervades all directions, even against the wind. A candle, which indicates wisdom, it's light. 
and incense, which indicates samadhi, concentration, because it's one point. And one gives these things. Uh, in a lot of Asian countries, they'll also offer like things that they think the Buddha would like. Fanta soda, I've seen. Chips Ahoy. Uh, you can, it's okay to offer some stuff, you know, develop a relationship with that. And of course, the biggest thing that we can offer is our surrender, our views, our defilements. Just give them all up for the sake of this practice. I was speaking to someone recently who was wrestling with the fifth precept. And the idea was that it's just one glass of wine. And fair enough, it is. And that's not the end of the world. If one has something to drink every now and again, you're, it's better than drinking a lot. Um, and, but what's the, di why I found that fifth precept to be so significant in the lives of so many people is that it's the difference between surrender and not surrender. It's the difference between a completely wholehearted offering of oneself and views and everything and negotiating with the path. And it reminds me of that story of St. Teresa of Avila, who I've, I've talked about before, when she was running away from her Renaissance home and to join the Desert Fathers or some uh, Christian practitioners. And she had one coin to buy bread with. And as she was escaping in the middle of the night, she heard a voice in her head that said, do you have faith in me or in a coin? And she said, you, Lord, and she dropped the coin. And similarly, that feeling of complete surrender and complete giving up of one's intention to a higher goal is significant and that doesn't have to hinge on the fifth, fifth precept this is just an example if people don't hold that it's the monks daughter judge this isn't a judgmental place it's just one aspect of where we can think of giving a gift of sanctifying a life by sacrificing something and that sila, morality, and the practice are the largest gift that we can give to the spiritual path, to the Buddha, to the Dhamma, to the Sangha. Last week, uh, I went to um, a, an art exhibit. Uh, someone offered uh, a pass to the new interactive Van Gogh exhibit. And stepping into it, it was very interesting to see how our culture's need to worship and exalt something had been poured into this. And I love the Impressionists, but Van Gogh's story is really sad. <laughs> he lived uh, a brutal life, cut off his ear, and then committed suicide. And it was interesting to see the nearest thing I've ever seen to a secular church raised in honor of, granted, beautiful art, but something in me felt like it wasn't worth the heart that we were placing into it, and that something in us and in our culture was searching for something larger. But there was one quote where he said, a good work of art is like a good deed. And I thought that was relevant with Van Gogh because one thing he was so famous for was pan painting many iterations of the same object again and again and again until he got it perfect, seeing it from every different angle, whether it be sunflowers or bales of hay, the most mundane things in a life. And I think that's what we do as practitioners. The frustrating things with samsara and with these karmic patterns of orphaning ourselves or alienating ourselves from others or controlling too much or becoming angry is that we repeat them again and again. 
and we don't understand so often why we keep being subjugated to these same patterns, these same sankara. But this is what samsara is. And the Christians talk about it like a spiral staircase, as you are circling around to the same patterns again and again, but every time you're encountering them on a slightly more refined level and skimming off some of the defilement and contortion and ugliness and you're cleaning away that karma little by little and cultivating something beautiful in its place. So even though it might feel like the same relationship, the same dynamic manifesting, one can acknowledge that there might actually be something deeper happening as well. And our relationship to that dynamic might be different than it's been before. And this is why even in a mundane life, in a relationship where we get up and greet our loved one the same way we have uh, so many days in the past, where we have, you know, the same breakfast with this person, where so many of the interactions are things we've gone through year after year. But if we think that what we're trying to do is perfect that moment as a work of art, that we're trying to make it as beautiful as we possibly could, and that that's our duty as practitioners, to paint that one painting, that one moment, again and again, and see if we can do it perfectly. There's a famous teacher named Ajahn Boonrat who the entire practice that Ajahn Mun gave him was the five precepts. And he said, keep these precepts perfectly in body, speech, and mind. And that was enough to take him to awakening. So all to say that there's, in, there's almost infinite realm for refinement in each of these. And I know for me, speech is something I continually am astounded by how far I have to go. And yet that's a gift because I know that each conversation is another chance to perfect that. And just as Van Gogh wasn't trying to paint the perfect sunflower, but refining his technique and color and touching something transcendent in the form of beauty through those iterations of a mundane moment, even so our interaction day to day with the mundane, usual interactions and conversations we have with a loved one, what they can be is another chance to refine the quality of attention, the restraint, the feeling of care, of listening, and of using every one of those interactions in the service of a greater goal. And that's a good goal for Valentine's Day, I think. At least that's what us monks tell each other, each other when we get, you know. So, good. So we have some time for questions. If people want, have anything they'd like to discuss or talk about. So the question was uh, speaking about the fifth uh, precept, the navigating, um, not just giving up, say, the things explicitly mentioned, such as alcohol or drugs, but all the other things we use to distract ourselves and how to decide how far to go without uh, really creating conditions for failure and relapse and just generally misery, something like that. Yeah, in the way most conducive to practice. Thich Nhat Hanh uh, expanded the fifth precept to include an encouragement towards refraining from intoxicating media and the like. Um, 
And I think that's a useful, you know, we, we do know those parts of our lives and such that it might be, we know we'd rather give up, you know, and fair enough. I think, first of all, the, your caution is well-grounded, I think. Um, so often people jump straight into this path with a, with a sort of really intense zeal. Um, and that's great, but it can pendulum to the point where they're excising huge portions of their happiness and, and life and really tying themselves up into knots. And that's kind of inevitable. We do overdo it at first, and that's fine. But, um, you know, this, this path isn't just about giving up, but cultivating a, a wholesome pleasure to sustain us in the absence of all the stuff we've used before, which we might know is junk food, but the problem is when we're too eager to cut that out and then we have nothing to replace it at all. So, you know, I, I think that ethic of gentle movement is, is good in terms of, um, I mean, the Buddha did support, give the five precepts as a basis uh, in terms of, say, intoxicating substance, and just he supported just doing that. Um, but in terms of all those other things that we can give up and renounce, you know, uh, I think approaching it with a certain amount of gentleness and wisdom is, is important. And sometimes you really, it, it's nice to curl up with a movie or a piece of music, you know. Um, uh, and if you're not a monk, and, um, yeah, and, and that's fine. Um, you just sort of have to navigate that yourself, I, I'd say, yeah. Uh, but, but I do think it's, it is a really Theravada, our articulation of this path is, is, I like that it has teeth, you know. There are these bright lines that laid down. I mean, it, there are these ways of pushing yourself. And... It's a potent medicine, and you need a big spoonful of sugar to help. Um, and I think that sugar that we're cultivating, quote unquote, that sweetness is community, giving. Um, I find there's really wholesome means of cultivating love in the heart to sort of sustain one through the practice, such as writing or artistic endeavor. Um, but also, yeah, you have to work towards those things slowly. And some of the other stuff in the world that we use it's, um, it's there, and yeah, just being gentle with that movement I think is good. I think a good language to keep in mind on this path is, uh, you know, gentleness and warmth. I think that's a really good ethic. Like, if you find yourself really tying yourself up into knots, that's not great. That being said, there's a quality called aditana in our tradition, which means determination, which is where you just say, I will not do this, or whatever. And there's times where you've just been through this thing, you know you can give up, you know you should give up, you're tired of it, you've seen this movie so many times, where it's just nice to take that sword of Aditana and say, I will not, you know, I'm done, whatever. And you make that vow in front of a Buddha image or to a friend, and I think I've spoken before about you can write a check to your least favorite political candidate and give it to a friend and say that if I break my, this aditana, I will call you and you need to mail this. Um, so there's ways you can work, but, but yeah, there's, that's an important realm of navigation. Absolutely. Yeah. I understand. So the yeah. question, the question, no, it's good. I'm going to see if I can get it. The question is sort of around this fifth precept idea, resistance coming up a little bit in that um, there seems to be instances where, uh, you know, either stuff that might seem like an intoxicant, even such as media or um, something else, is actually serving a pretty wholesome purpose, such as connection or just a well-deserved moment of relaxation. And then in other instances where stuff that isn't an intoxicant explicitly is being used in the service of that, such as like, you know, exercise or something. And just to say a little more, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, 
And it's why I actually sort of stumbled into that whole fifth precept thing. I didn't actually mean for it to go there because it's a whole discussion in itself. I would first say that the, the fifth precept is, is only against um, intoxicants such as alcohol and stuff, like the purview of music and movies. Um, it's an interesting realm to take it into, you know, if one finds that one is going to that stuff for distraction regularly, but it's not part of the precept. Um, it's just an interesting realm to play with, you know, insofar as one wants to take it there. And I think there's, you know, certainly uh, like wholesome uses for some of those things, you know, I mean, there's really beautiful music. Uh, if you're meditating a lot, it can get stuck in your head, which is, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, it's not great to do before retreat, but, um, you know, or, or when you're with certain people like your family, like maybe how they do connect is to watch a football game or something and just being able to sit down with them and not be weird. It's good not to be weird or a jerk. Like, that's a good ethic through all this stuff, is don't be a jerk. Um, and uh, that, monks fall into that a lot, uh, actually. It's because, you know, you, you can really not figure out how to keep a lot of the rules. Um, so no, that, that's different. Um, with the question of explicitly intoxicating substances, that's interesting because you're right, on one level, and it's why I don't usually stress it, is because, um, you know, it's so much more important to give up killing and lying, you know. For most people, the, a glass of wine is not a huge deal. And from a Buddhist conception of rebirth, the chance to have this quality of mindfulness is the rarest thing in samsara that one has almost ever gotten. It, it's sacred. And so there's some sense of almost like any way of uh, altering that is, is touching something sacred. And I think that's one of the reasons it's held so carefully. Um, I also think it's helpful for me sometimes to recollect, like, when I was a kid and my parents had a glass of beer, I, I noticed a difference. Like, something did change and I didn't like it. Um, and then there's, there's also just the fact that even if in a certain moment, we really can, you know, just have one glass of wine. A lot of people can't. And it's really meaningful to have some people in someone's life, say a kid, who they can look at and see that, like, not all adults have to just drink all the time when they get together. Like, there are a few people that they've seen who, you know, they just don't. Um, so those are some of the, like, reasonings around that explicit holding of that. But also, like, if one is cultivating these other aspects of the path, like, I don't think that should be this huge, you know, the, the precepts are known as training rules, so they're just ways we work to train ourselves. And, like, we do our best, um, and, uh, but they're just one aspect of the path, and it's not like there's this punishment coming down on us. It's more the Buddha saying, these are really helpful things for cultivating, say, meditation and stuff. And so that's a bit of it. But yeah, I think watching a movie every now and again, and, and you know, it's fine. Yeah.